Okay, so the Cavs went out in very disappointing fashion um, in this year's playoffs. And there's a lot to talk about what needs to change for this Cavs team to avoid something like that from happening again. What does need to go? What doesn't need to go? We're going to talk all about that. But before that, I want to thank my sponsor for today's video, DraftKings. The playoffs are about to be in full swing and teams are fighting to advance to the next round as they pursue eternal basketball glory. Today's video sponsor, DraftKings, is bringing high stakes action to all new customers. DraftKings is offering all new customers $150 in bonus bets if their pregame money line wager of five dollars cashes again that's 150 dollars in bonus bets if your pre-game money line wager of five dollars cashes wondering what you could use a hundred and fifty dollars in bonus bets on try DraftKings same game parlays where you can combine multiple bets from the same game into one big bet at a shot for an even bigger payout. If mobile sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry, you can get in on the phone with DraftKings Daily Fantasy where they offer cash prizes for nearly every sport. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use the promo code CAVSBURNER, bet $5 on any pregame money line wager and get $150 in bonus bets if your bet hits. That's promo code Cavs burner only at DraftKings.com. Again, I want to thank the sponsor DraftKings today for sponsoring the video. Now let's get into it. All right. So the first thing, and this is kind of a moot point because this has already been expressed, is this matter of should the Cavs uh, fire JB? And I don't think they should, and it's not because I think J.B. Bickerstaff has proven himself to be a great coach. It's that I don't think he's proven himself to be anything positive or negative. Like what we saw in this New York Knicks series and the reason it's so frustrating was it really robbed us of an opportunity to evaluate J.B. Like this is one of the things we were looking forward to finding out in this series. But since they were so physically incapable of keeping the Knicks off the glass, we really didn't see who was out coaching who or who was out strategizing the other because it was that bad from the onset. Like, there was nothing JB could do. And I know people are going to be upset about, oh, could he have thrown Lamar Stevens out there? Or could he have played this guy more minutes? And at the end of the day, we're talking about very, very small and fine adjustments to try to solve a big problem, right? Putting Lamar Stevens out there, I'm sorry. Like, I'm as big as a Lamar Stevens fan as anybody. And I think this channel has been as friendly to Lamar Stevens as anybody. But sticking out Lamar Stevens out there and expecting that to solve the, the Cavs rebound issues in that series would have been like putting a piece of paper over a hole on the Titanic. Like it, it, it will slow some water for sure, but it's not really going to matter because there's a much bigger problem here. And JB, what happened to the Cavs in the playoffs? This is not his fault. Now, could something have happened in the playoffs if the Cavs were able to rebound more effectively, able to just compete physically just a little bit better could something have happened where jb maybe would have made the difference absolutely but that series was so uncompetitive that it didn't matter who the coach was for the cleveland cavaliers that never mattered that series was decided by the rosters that came in there and that was always going to be how it was this wasn't a ball bounce one way or the other so i just really don't think we have enough to evaluate jb on and that could hurt this team down the line if we find out in another series where we do have a better roster that oh it, jb can't coach too right but we don't know so we can't just drastically fire a dude after winning 50 games from this franchise for the first time without lebron and since the 90s we can't just fire that dude when we don't know it. he's the problem
that's just not something we have the luxury of being able to do. Like you imagine how unhinged that would make us look to the rest of the NBA. So there's a reason why they're not going to move in that direction. Um, now let's talk about some of the players. Darius Garland, I think probably offended people in Cleveland the least, right? Is despite the fact that people love to like get on DG's ass about certain things, um, I think he probably offended people the least because there were moments where DG definitely showed up. Three moments in particular, game two, um, where he dominated in that game in a way that I've never seen him dominate, and then game four and five where he was the spearhead in a run that never solidified because Dar- Donovan Mitchell was just missing shot at the shot at the shot. So Darius Garland, I think nobody's going to really want you to move off of him. Now, Donovan Mitchell, all right. Like, I've been a huge fan of the Donovan Mitchell experience. I think we've had a lot of fun during the regular season with him. But one of the things that you have to ask yourself some questions about is, hey, one time is a coincidence when it comes to his woes in the playoffs. Two times. Now, that's a trend, right? And that's a trend in a negative direction. Now we have seen him off the strength of two off uh two pre uh, postseason runs be deemed as good good postseason player. Now he's had two awful postseason series, um, and this one was worse than the one he had in Utah last year. So what's up with that? If you're Donovan Mitchell, I hope it's not a permanent thing with you because he's a really good player, but for whatever reason, he was terrible. And I think part of the reason he was terrible was he scored like 40 points the six games before the season ended. And he had to go into that mode super early that I think by the time the playoffs came around, he had nothing left. So that's also on the cast supporting staff that he doesn't have to score 40 points to make sure you clinch your playoff spot. But it's also on Donovan Mitchell to be better than that. Like, that's just inexcusably bad how bad he was. That being said, he's going to be here next year, and until his contract runs out, there's really nothing to talk about when it comes to Donovan Mitchell moving. I don't think they're going to trade him this offseason. That wouldn't really make much sense. A player who is interesting is Karis LeVert. What do you do with him exactly? Because Karis played well in the playoffs. But also, you're going to need to upgrade in some spots that you're probably going to have to get rid of some players that you do like. But on the other hand to that argument, Karis LeVert is one of three players on this team that could dribble, pass, and shoot and get their own shot. And the Cavs are just in a bind with that, right? He's not somebody who can play the three and be a true three. So he's not your wing starter. And when he's out there offensively, sometimes he's very productive. Sometimes he's a ball stopper and doesn't help this team be efficient. He's wildly inconsistent. Um, He's better off the bench. And yes, while your bench does stink, you have some issues up front that you need to solve and that that position could solve. But he's not that kind of player that's going to help you when it comes to physicality, rebounding, and and the traditional small forward stuff. He plays more like a guard. So is Karis LeVert a luxury this team can afford anymore? I'm not 100% sure. Could Jetty be just as productive in his minutes as Karis? Because, again, that's another issue you have. Jetty and Karis play the same position, have the same body type, and have the same faults. They're the same player. Both inconsistent. They get buckets in different ways, but they both can't pass. They both don't look up when they're on fast breaks. Like, they're they're, they're the same player with the same faults. And it's like, what sense does it have to have both these dudes on the roster anymore? Because we don't even play them both all the time. So, I don't know what to do there with with, with Karis LeVert. Um, Good player. But sometimes you need to trade a good player to get other players that fit better. And Karis might be the first one on the block. Uh, speaking of players who are going to be on the block, Jared Allen, didn't expect that. Completely didn't expect that we'd be sitting here today talking about Jared Allen being on the on the cutting block. Or on, not on the cutting block. He's not going to get cut on the trading block for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Didn't expect that. 
But Mitchell Robinson exposed something so serious about the issue with this team's front court. As much prowess as they're going to get with their exploits defensively in the regular season, in a seven-game series, they have a serious problem. Now, I thought this was a problem that was only going to come up against the elite teams in the NBA. And even then, I thought, hey, look, once this team's ready to make that leap, and that's quasi when Evan Mobley's ready to make that leap into good player to great player, if he ever gets there, that's when you get rid of Jared Allen. Because I thought Jared Allen was still enough to get you past Mitchell Robinson and the New York Knicks. But he's not. So what do you do there, right? Because if he's not going to be able to be physical against a Mitchell Robinson, that's going to send a signal to everybody else in the league that, hey, you know this Jared Allen dude that we may or may not have had issues with in the past? Well, we just found out the cheat code. Getting his chest. He's soft. And players usually don't recover from that sort of thing um, when people feel like the, the memo's been put out on you. Because, again, Mitchell Robinson's a good big. He's not a great big. If this had happened to Bam, like if Bam had did this to him, I would understand. That's why I didn't want to play the Heat in the first round. But Mitchell Robinson shouldn't dominate you. Will he out-rebound you every once in a while? Absolutely. He's a good player. But he should not dominate you. And, again, what is Jared Allen's function on this team if he's not able to out-rebound or at least be competitive with the Mitchell Robinson? The answer is there is no role for him on the team. Now, he's somebody who can be an effective player for somebody else, a team that doesn't have a big. They needs a big who just needs to run and be athletic and dunk and all of that. Like, a team that basically is in the same position the Cavs were when they gave Tristan Thompson all that money. That's a team that could really use Jared Allen. But the Cavs are no longer that team. Because if we just need a big to get out there and run and rebound and, and get dunks, Evan Mobley can do that plus. So what's Jared Allen there for? He wasn't a shot blocker. He was horrid. Defend like, all of the stuff with Mitchell Robinson has really let Jared Allen off the hook for how bad he was defensively. And I'm not just meaning, oh, he wasn't blocking shots. Like, watch that series again and look how slow he is to rotate and, and to be aware that guys are cutting to the hoop or or how bad he was on the perimeter trying to defend guys like he was horrible defensively and i know he's gonna say the lights are bright and all that but that's just not an excuse for a player his age that's been to the playoffs before it's just not it's just not we were counting on you to be somebody who could hold this team down you weren't even close to that you were honestly a liability we were calling for Robin Lopez and Lamar Stevens. That tells you everything you need to know about how horrible Jared Allen played. Um, and that's something we should listen to. That wasn't like, again, like Donovan Mitchell was just missing shots. That's different than getting dominated physically by Mitchell Robinson. Like missing shots. Okay, maybe in another series you make those shots. That's, that's easily correctable. Jared Allen getting dominated physically ain't nothing you can do about that. You can't adjust yourself out of a butt whipping, right? Like if I'm about to fight Mike Tyson, it does not matter who my coach is. It does not matter who is training me. I'm fighting Mike Tyson. You ain't going to just and coach yourself out of a butt whipping. That's all I'm saying. And Jared Allen's like, what are we going to do? We going we gonna to coach him to rebound? Dog, he's been in the league forever. Ain't nothing you can do with that. So he's going to have to probably go somewhere else. That brings in the question, like, okay, well, what do you look to bring in if you're not going to have Jared Allen? Well, you need size and you need physicality. Now, there are two players that come to mind that will be available or could be available that are interesting to me. Draymond Green, which I think, and I want to go on record, is one of those ideas that will either be laughed at at the beginning, but genius at the end, or laughed at at the beginning and done by the trade deadline. Like, this is either a disaster or it's not. But either way, you're going to get laughed at for doing this. Like, nobody's going to think this is a good move at the initial onset of it. Um, it would kind of make sense. Theoretically, it does, right? Draymond can kind of, well, 
used to be able to shoot, um, is a good defender, fits in with the Cavs mode. You put him and Evan Mobley together, like those two dudes are so smart mentally that they're going to be able to figure out these things. And while Draymond's not the biggest guy in the world, he's actually much smaller than Jared Allen. While being undersized, he's never been out rebounded or out physical by anybody, including the likes of Mitchell Robinson. So you're not going to worry about those things there. He's going to bring a different edge to this team. He's going to bring a certain element of leadership to this team. And on paper, it might work. Like if this is 2K, I might do it. But I don't know if Draymond Green is the right thing you want to mix with this team. So again, that's a that's a very volatile solution. Um, you know. What I feel like they're going to do is do some, like, small stuff, like sign Montrez Harrell to be the backup forward for this team or something like that so you can have that element but not really have to sacrifice anything. I don't know what the Cavs do, but it is clear that the Cavs need to do some things. It is clear that there are issues with the way that this team was built. And as much as we can point fingers at Jared Allen, which – is fair as much as we can point fingers at JB which people are going to do he's the coach as much as we can point fingers at Donovan Mitchell which is fair we also need to point those same fingers at Kobe Altman how this team adjust this offseason will be the fork in the road that will either point the Cavs towards a successful post LeBron era or a absolute failure of a post LeBron era it will be what points that arrow of a Donovan Mitchell trade into a win or a loss we're going to find out. This is the most important offseason that the Cavs have had since one of them ones with LeBron. So let me know what you think in the comment section below. Y'all have a great day. Have a good night.